International Military Tribunal Associate Counsel, Lieutenant Colonel William Baldwin. 29, Lieutenant Colonel William Baldwin was the youngest prosecutor at the podium. Responsible for the prosecution of Hans Frank, a lawyer who became an active and enthusiastic Nazi in the late 1920s. After the German armies overran Poland, Hitler appointed Frank Governor General of Poland. More than any other person, he was responsible for the liquidation and deportation of nearly the entire Jewish population of Poland. During his rule, he sent more than two million Poles to Germany. They were used as slave laborers. When he was captured on May 3, 1945, he attempted to commit suicide, but failed. His diary was seized and used as evidence against him. Prior to the trial, William Baldwin, who worked for Lieutenant Colonel John Amon, was present during an extraordinary testimony of Rudolf Hess. The idea was Robert Jackson's to try to have Rudolf Hess shake amnesia. So during the course of this testimony, Hermann Goering was introduced to the interrogation. Here's William Baldwin's recollection of that extraordinary interrogation. Your name is Rudolf Hess, yes. You look to the right of this gentleman. At him, pointing to Goering. Yes. Don't you know me, Goering says? Who are you? <laughs> You ought to know, we've been together for years. That must have been at the same time as the book that was submitted to me this morning. I've lost my memory for some time. It's terrible. Don't you know me? You don't recognize me? Goering was furious. <laughs> no, but we talked a lot together. Not personally, but I remember your name. We were together. They were both in the Richthofen squadron. Listen, Hess. I was the Supreme Commander of the Luftwaffe. You flew to England in one of my planes. Don't you remember I was the Supreme Commander? First I was a field marshal and later a Reich marshal. Don't you remember? Yes, no. <laughs> Don't you remember I was made a Reich marshal, a Reich marshal at the meeting of the Reichstag where you were present? Don't you remember that? Yes, no. Don't you remember that the Fuhrer at a meeting of the Reichstag announced in the Reichstag that if something happened to him, that I would be his successor? If something happened to me, you were to be my successor? Don't you remember that? No. You don't remember that? We too discussed that very long afterwards. Yes, this is terrible. The doctors, blah, blah, blah. And you were there? Yeah. Well, I was born in uh, February 21, 1916 in Detroit, Michigan. I went to uh, Central High School in Detroit since 38. Following that, I was, uh, went to law school, University of Michigan, class of 41. I um, was classified 4F because I was wearing glasses at the time and had a very severe myopia problem. Lewis School of Aeronautics then had a, a um, contract to train glider pilots uh, in Mesa, Texas, a place which doesn't deserve uh, going to really. It was a, a, a kind of a dull place. In any event, I went down there. We graduated two classes. This was under a, a uh, a program which permitted some of us old guys, or old men, who had disabilities to, had, but nonetheless we had certificates to train. After two groups, they got rid of us, rescinded the waivers and permitted us to teach. And uh, I then drove back to Michigan and went down to Washington. And because of the fact that I had a, uh, a license, both glider and power, 
only Taylor, Taylor Craft and Piper Cubs, but, uh, which I did in the law school. Uh, nonetheless, I was able to, uh, to get uh, a commission. That is to say, I went down to the officer's school in Miami and got a commission. Then was sent up to, to uh, Indianapolis, the Troop Carrier Command, which was the one that was in charge of the glider program. They had no room for me there, and they pushed me off to the, how, how much of this do you want? This is wonderful, absolutely. I want to know the William Baldwin story. <laughs> in any event, I got up there, and there was no room for me at the headquarters. The TO was completely filled, so they sent me over to base. And I became base legal officer and base um, personnel officer and a couple of other things that were about as dull as you can get. And I thought, this is what I made an effort to get out of the practice for. Well, it was February, and Indianapolis is a pretty dull place then. We were burning soft coal, and that didn't help. But then, for reasons I'll never know, I was asked to come into Washington by uh, had some hand in getting me in. Why do you constantly do that? It enhances the value of the site. Go ahead. All right. Smith was, uh, wanted me to come into Washington because they, they had uh, an office there and they needed personnel. And I guess he was uh, willing to take me on. Uh, when I, by the time I got there, Colonel Smith and Lewin Berger, Major Lewin Berger from Philadelphia, who was a glider pilot, yeah, a private, <laughs> were lost en route from uh, between Puerto Rico and Trinidad. They were en route to England to see what the status of the English glider program was. So there I was in Washington on temporary duty, a uh, second lieutenant with one other guy. First Lieutenant Harry Wise, and that was the glider program. Then Dick DuPont, who was a glider pilot and had devised several means of using gliders, came in uh, as a special assistant to General Arnold for glider matters. We went up to the very top. And uh, <coughs> Dick asked me to go with him. I did, and there were some other people as well. And uh, among other things, there was a being tested a, a CG-10 glider, right, in cargo, <coughs> which was designed by a fellow by the name of Holly Bolas in California. Mm -hmm. We went out there, and uh, the idea was that this, it was a clamshell opening thing, Brunelli design wing, and uh, it was to carry a a number of people inside there and also probably jeeps. It was a big deal and it was going to be flown from Marchfield in California to Washington to be seen by a group of dignitaries. It was set up <coughs> and we got out there to Marchfield and I wanted to go up in it, which I could do because it was not an, aircraft, uh, an Air Force aircraft. <coughs> but um, I was kicked off the flight behind the C-54, or C-47, I guess it was, by uh, Colonel, what's his name? I forgot his name, who was the administrative head or executive officer for DuPont. He was a command pilot and knew his power piloting pretty well, but he didn't know what to do when a glider behind the C-47 began to porpoise. This was connected by a nylon rope and uh, they got up there, and I was directed by Colonel Gable, his name was, G-A-B-E-L. He kicked me off the flight and told me to take the Jeep and go over to the quartermaster and see if the supplies for the flight were uh, in order. I didn't get very far in the Jeep before I heard uh, the wail of a siren. And uh, what had happened was that Gable, who was piloting, uh, it began to porpoise behind the aircraft. There's a way of taking care of that, but Gable didn't know it. And as a result, the pilot of the power aircraft cut him loose. He then went into a flat spin. Two of Holly Bolas's people bailed out safely. <coughs> Dick DuPont bailed out, but he, he, he 
remembered that he was told never to pull the ripcord until he counted 10. By that time, he was dead on the ground. Cable went down with the aircraft and was killed. So we never made the flight back, and I got off out of it by happenstance. Following that, uh, I, I, I was with the uh, Headquarters Army Air Forces with the in Operation Commitments and Requirements, and uh, did that for quite a while, and went with OSS for a bit. And while there, I was uh, Jackson, had General Donovan as an associate. Hey, talk to me about Wild Bill Donovan. You know, he's from our neck of the woods also, Buffalo, New York. I, did, I, I don't have much to say about him. Uh, he was uh, he was very concerned about uh, what was going on. He thought he knew a lot about it, and he did. He, I mean, uh, but he and Jackson didn't get along, okay. and uh, so. Donovan. I remember him coming in to one time to Colonel Story was my boss, and he and I had met flying over, and we became friends. And uh, he became executive trial counsel, and I became his executive officer. So I was privy to a good many things by chance again. Donovan came in one day, and he was uh, concerned about Story's state. Story had a lot of responsibilities, and he, he would on occasion become overcome by them. So Donovan stopped in one day to see me. I was then a major, I guess. <coughs> and he said, uh, he asked me questions about story as to whether I thought he was all right or not. <laughs> that's the only contact I had with Donovan. Now that's because he felt like he could talk to you as you were part of the OSS? No, it didn't have anything to do with that. He talked to me because he knew I was executive officer for Colonel Story. That was the only reason. Well, in General Donovan's law office, uh, Donovan, Newton, Leisure, and Lombard, right. you probably know the right. name. Donovan, Leisure. Um, Eddie Lombard was a friend of my father's, and I played golf with him down at Hot Springs and elsewhere when my father and I went on vacation with my mother and so on. And uh, as it so happened, or done by chance, Donovan told Eddie Lombard to help him with this recruiting. So my father was in New York one day having lunch with Lombard, and uh, Eddie Lombard said to my father, do you think Bill would be interested in going to, on this Nuremberg trial? And Dad said, well, I don't know. I'll give him a ring. And I said, yes, and he went. Yeah, now, you were rich when you got, this would have been in uh, around July of 1945, you recall? Something like that. Yeah. And you were a little a earlier than that, actually. Wait. Followed Colonel Story wherever he went. It was, uh, and we became well. We were good friends. It was almost a father-son relationship. And as I say, I became his executive officer, and ultimately, he became head of the so-called documentation division. And uh, the documentation division was became the bulwark of the trial. And we were ready. We processed some 100,000 documents. And this was a chore. A lot of things had to be done. Translators, blah, blah, blah. So that when the time came to go, get ready to go to trial, the documentation division was the division that was ready. Were you at Nuremberg the whole time? Or had you gone to London at all? Oh, yeah. That's where I started. Left Washington on June 20, 1945, to OSS London. Went to Paris July 1, 1945. Went to Nuremberg August 10, 1945. Appeared before the tribunal on 10 January 1946. Late January 46, became head of the rebuttal division. Separated from the office of the U.S. Chief of Counsel, 3 May 46. Well. There were three other nations participating, right. and they would make requests for documents, and those went through me. Mm -hmm. And we maintained a, a library. Uh, it was a real chore getting these 100,000 documents processed and translated. And uh, I 
did whatever Colonel Story wanted me to do. Ray, your memo on 1,800,000 photos. Advised every effort should be made to obtain them. If you or Neumann believe they will be of direct benefit, Neumann thinks they will. But budget will not permit engaging any further civilian personnel. Can you find enough local military assistance to do job? Bill, this is the key from the story. Explain this to Demas, Robert W. Story. I don't know what the hell it was, but. If Berlin, then not till stuff is found. I mean, that's the sort of thing that would get. <coughs> I had to deal with the various delegations that wanted one thing or another. The London Poles, the Norwegians, whatever else. What about the Russians? Did you have much interaction with them? No. They, they live by themselves. You are asked to take on Hans Frank. No, that isn't quite true. I asked to take on Hans Frank. <laughs> Uh, well, I didn't ask to take on uh, any specific person, but I, I did want to appear before the tribunal, which is a matter of ego satisfaction. And since I had sufficient clout, I went to the people who were handling the trial itself and said, I want to appear. And uh, they said, well, we've got Hans Frank. And that's what I took. I was assigned Hans Frank because by that time, that was the only defendant available and this was under count one of the indictment, right. which was the U.S. responsibility, the conspiracy count. Well, I, there was a person by the name of Harriet Zetterberg who prepared most of it because I was very busy on other matters. When I say busy, I mean from 7 in the morning until 11 at night. There were a lot of things to be done. She prepared it, and uh, I reviewed it and uh, presented it to the tribunal. It wasn't done very well, apparently, because Frank was not convicted under count one. He was under three and four, but not one. Yeah. But at least I was there. There's a picture of me up there. This report that in September 1941, disease affected 40% of the Polish population. Nevertheless, the defendant Frank approved in August 1942 a new plan which called for much larger contributions of foodstuffs to Germany at the expense of the non-German population of the general government. Methods of meeting the new quotas out of the grossly inadequate rations of the general government and the impact of the new quotas on the economy of the country were discussed at a cabinet meeting of the general government on 24 August 1942, in terms which leave no possible doubt that not only was the proposed requisition beyond the resources of the country, but its force was to be distributed on a grossly discriminatory basis. This appears from Frank's diary. I quote the following extracts. Before the German people, says Frank, are to experience starvation, the <coughs> occupied territories, and their people shall be exposed to starvation. In this moment, therefore, we here in the general government must also have the iron determination to help the great German people, our fatherland. Defendant Frank was not only responsible for reducing the general government to starvation level, but was proud of the contribution he thereby made to the Reich. I refer to a statement made to the political leaders of the NSDAP on 14 December 1942 at Krakow. It is contained in the Frank Diary. The projects relating to resettling districts in the general government were submitted to and approved by the defendant Frank. We are now duty bound to hold together. And I quote Frank, we must remember that we who are gathered here figure on Mr. Roosevelt's list of war criminals. I have the honor of being number one. <coughs> we have, so to speak, become accomplices in the world historic sense. I don't know that he was designated as number one. This is, I think he quoted himself. Yeah. He was, uh, 
he re-embraced Catholicism during the trial. And he became very angry that there was some evidence that the uh, Pope had uh, not given assistance enough to uh, to the uh, Jewish uh, massacre, which uh, was denied for a long time and has since been admitted. You, there weren't many people who had the opportunity to go on the podium, and, and you were one of them. I was the youngest one to appear before the court. I was 29 at the time. So you walk into the court, and there's Chief Justice Lawrence looking out over the putting at your head. What, what, what's was, your feeling? I was, I was concerned that I wouldn't be able to uh, <coughs> do a very good job, I suppose. Well, I, no, I, that isn't fair. I, it was written out. All I had to do was read it. Were you curious about once you got done with your presentation, kind of, gee, I wonder how I did? Not really. I was just glad it was over and that I'd done it. I could say I did it and that I was relatively young. As it turned out, I was the youngest to be before the tribunal. Hans Frank's diary, that was sort of the uh, smoking gun for himself. Oh, yeah. Very, it was uh, beautifully done up in, in red Morocco leather. Amazing. There were the waters. And he, he offered them, really. Right. Frank was a strange man. He was a... Uh, oh, well. That's, well that's what it, didn't he say at one time, a thousand years will pass, and still the guilt of Germany no. will not have been erased? Uh, I had an affair with Re Rebecca West, mm -hmm. the, the author. And at some point in her books, which I read, he referred to him as having the looks of an intelligent swan. He had a long neck. Well, he, <laughs> he was given the job uh, because I think Truman felt uh, some uh, guilt in not ha keeping him on as attorney general or whatever. And uh, he wanted to be chief justice. And I believe that that uh, Jackson talked him out of it in order to permit Jeffrey Lawrence to have you take the job. Lawrence, who would write little notes every now and then to some of the more attractive ladies <laughs> doing the uh, interpretation. I hear from Drexel a great deal. Is he still alive? From Drexel? Yeah. yeah. He's still alive. He's indefatigable. He is. <laughs> that he is. <laughs> Your reaction is like Brady Bryson. Did you know Brady? Only briefly. I was very mad at him because uh, he, was, he, he was in the Navy. <coughs> and he managed to get out of the trial quite early. And at some point, I've forgotten when, this is after Brady left and he was not subject to this, but we got transferred out of OSS into Shave, Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force which meant that it affected our points and all, and all of that. Bryson avoided that, and I always told him that. Well, what point did you first interface with Robert Jackson? I don't know. I played volleyball on Sundays at his place. That was about it. I didn't have much. I, I appear in that picture that I right. showed you. My channel was the story and story to Jackson. I didn't. Jackson was uh, was pretty occupied at one point in uh, finding out who the heck was going to run this trial, and there was a there was a group uh, uh, mainly of uh, I've forgotten the fellow's name, but in any event, it, it, it involved uh, T Taylor, Telford Taylor, and others who were early New Dealers, and. Uh, they were very anxious that they should take over the running of the trial. The trouble was that they, they didn't come up with anything that would suit the justice's requirement for carrying on a trial. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Story and the Documentation Division were processing all of these documents and it was decided that's the way it was going to be done. There was an Interrogation Division under Colonel Amen. But <laughs> so that was the reason that the story was there, and, and I don't think 
Taylor liked him particularly. He wasn't, the story wasn't sophisticated enough for Taylor's point of view. Essentially, uh, I was a little easy bone to mortgage, but I, I, I never liked uh, Taylor very much. Uh, he asked me to stay on and be his exec, which I turned down. You're probably anxious to get home. Well, I was turned out, yeah. The chief prosecutor for the United States of America. The privilege of opening. Were you there for the opening statement? Oh, yeah. What was your reaction? There are a number of photos of that. You're sitting in the, you're sitting there uh, in the stands, and Robert Jackson gets up to give his opening statement. Had you been given a copy of the? No, no. Uh, it was a, a wonderful opening statement. As a matter of fact, <coughs> I forgot which author it was. It was John O'Hara. It was in the group uh, at the opening. And uh, O'Hara later wrote, he said, uh, that day I was proud to be an American. And it was true, it was well presented. That was the Jackson's high point, I might say. His low point being? Gary. Then Harris was his uh, bag carrier on that, and I, something went awry. Were you there during that period of time? No. Well, I, I might have been there, but I didn't hear his. Maybe I heard part of it, I don't know. But I think Harris was at fault, and the justice was at fault. He lost his uh, temper, and uh, you know, and through the translation process, there's no way of building up a series of accusations and so on. For myself, what I do, or what I have done, is that I have helped my three daughters write papers during their school years, every one of them. And a number of these I, I got out are the result of getting things out for them. Uh, Robert Jackson in the whole mix of Nuremberg, do you have a sense as to his place in history in that? Nope, don't. As I say, the only time I saw the justice was, and I didn't see him really then, was when <laughs> we went over to play volleyball in his uh, most, uh, several Sundays, I think. And uh, I had no direct connection with Jackson. Jackson was, uh, had a lot of, uh, a lot on his plate. Hugo Black was on his plate. That's right. And uh, Jackson very much wanted that appointment, didn't get it, but uh, yeah, he was politicking for it while he was there, I was still, I just didn't want to. Herman Wilhelm Goering, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Joachim von Ribbentrop, death by hanging. Fritz Sauko, death by hanging. Julius Streicher, death by hanging. Wilhelm Frick, death by by hanging. Hans Frank, death by hanging. Alfred Rosenberg, death by hanging. Wilhelm Keitel, death by hanging. Ernst Schausenbrunner, death by hanging. Also sentenced to death were Yodel, Seiss Inquart, and Martin Borgman, who was tried in absentia. Hess, Funk, and Rader got life prison terms. Speer, von Schirach, von Neurath, and Dernitz got long sentences. My answer to that is that I really don't know. Uh, I, was, I wasn't in court at the time that the defense was presented, and uh, some of it was political, I know, but uh, I, I did not see a major difficulty in, in the judgments. There are plenty of people that would, of course, uh, shoot them all, you know. I remember once attending, uh, there was a, I forgot the name of the former Soviet uh, prosecutor, 
visited Nuremberg. And I was, uh, since I was Story's exec, I was invited to it, as were members of the court. And he gave a toast at the, at the dinner. Here's to the defendants, let's give them a fair trial and kill them, <laughs> or shoot them, something like that. And the judges were utterly appalled at that. You looked on the dock and you saw Hermann Goering or Rudolf Hess. Did you have any reaction to those guys? Well, I was in court uh, uh, m many, many days. I don't know how many, but quite a, from the opening until all of the time I left, uh, because I was uh, Colonel Story's exec, and Colonel Story was executive trial counsel. So it was either he or I was supposed to be there to make sure that things were running, which they did. There was no problem. And I, all I can say is that I got kind of worn out. I mean, I was not looking at them and saying, gee whiz, can you imagine that? They, they, the general feeling was, I think, that these uh, people who were out of uniforms, or out of the big uniforms they had in some cases, were, uh, I think, who was it that said the, banality or banal, uh, it was, uh, they didn't measure up to be full class uh, uh, well, full class murderers the way, which is what most of them were. Since you were in the court most of the time, or a lot of the time, uh, did you have a reaction as far as the British prosecutors were concerned and their abilities? Their abilities were first rate, no question. Better than ours, better than the French and Soviets, certainly. Anybody in particular on the team that you were impressed? Oh, Sir David Maxwell Fife, I guess. Mm -hmm. He was there for the whole time, running it. Mm -hmm. A very stern black Scotsman that knew his stuff. Very good. One thing uh, Colonel Lima did when, when Hess was brought back from England, you know that story. Yeah. Uh, Eamon always with an eye to the uh, to public relations decided that it was a good idea to confront Hess with some of his former buddies, Goering, Van Poppen, and there were two others, and also the, uh, the 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 guy who who was Hess's professor. One of the things that I can't give you, although you can look at it, was the interrogation of Hess with these other guys. What's your full name, Rudolf Hess? I sat in on this because I was interested in it. This is after he's brought back. What was your reaction to Hess? As you sat in on it, you're watching him? Did you sense he, did you sense he was Incompetent? Uh, he was out of it. Yeah. The strange thing, though, know, I was in court when uh, the uh, there were a group of four uh, appointed to examine. They were all generally well known for for their fields and uh, mental conditions, etc. And they came in with a report that uh, Hess was was out of it. That he was. And uh, Hess, who was sitting there reading a book, this was about five o'clock in the afternoon, maybe four or something like this, got up and said, well, he was perfectly all right to stay in trial, that, uh, he, that all of this had been put on. And the, <laughs> the journalists came running back. It was extraordinary. Of course, he lapsed after that. But he had a momentary flash. Don't worry about me, fellas. Did it take everybody by surprise? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Rudolph Hess, yes. He looked to the right of this gentleman. At him, pointing to Goering. Yes. Don't you know me, Goering says? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> you ought to know. We've been together for years. That must have been at the same time as the book that was submitted to me this morning. I've lost my memory for some time. It's terrible. 
Don't you know me? You don't recognize me? Gurney was furious. At me. No, but we talked a lot together. Not personally, but I remember your name. We were together. They were both in the Richthofen squadron. Listen, Hess, I was the Supreme Commander of the Luftwaffe. You flew to England in one of my planes. Don't you remember I was the Supreme Commander? First I was a field marshal and later a Reich marshal. Don't you remember? Hess, no. <laughs> Don't you remember I was made a Reich marshal, a Reich marshal at the meeting of the Reichstag where you were present? Don't you remember that? Hess, no. Don't you remember that the Fuhrer at the meeting of the Reichstag announced in the Reichstag that something happened to him, that I would be his successor? If something happened to me, you were to be my successor? Don't you remember that? No. You don't remember that? We too discussed that very long afterwards. Yes, this is terrible. The doctors, blah, blah, blah. And you were there? Yeah. The man. Legacy of Nuremberg to you. Uh, the legacy is that uh, we we uh, produced and uh, a record that can't be assailed. That's all. Period. Nothing more. I mean, if you're talking about uh, deterring people from, there's no deterrence to it. I mean, if the uh, dictator wants to do something. He isn't going to be deterred by the fact he's going to be tried. In my opinion. In any event, but the record, of the record, the, the record, the trial record itself is unassailable. I think we reviewed some 100,000 documents, of which six or seven thousand were introduced into evidence, or rather, were prepared for introduction. I've forgotten how many were introduced, but in every case, those documents were were given, as I understood it, to the defense counsel 24 hours in advance which was unusual, as you know, and uh, therefore if they had any question about the authenticity of the documents themselves, they had ample opportunity to make that question. And I, as I recollect it, I don't think there were more than two or three documents whose authenticity was questioned. So the record stands, it was that, that what, that's what happened. That's the main thing about it.